Thank you, Ken. Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Pastor Ron for allowing me to speak today. Rob? Okay, I'm learning people here. Um, you might wonder, uh, why am I doing this? Um, I've been the senior pastor in San Francisco for the past 16 years. Um, we have 13 Seventh-day Adventist churches in San Francisco. We have a lot of ethnic churches. We have a Russian church. We have Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Filipino. And I am the pastor of, I call it the Mutt Church. We kind of have everybody come to our church. Uh, it's mainly English. We do have some Sabbath schools in different uh, languages. But whenever I travel, I like to just volunteer to uh, help out because I know a lot of pastors have many churches. So um, I thank you for allowing me to do this. It's kind of risky, you know, to allow a pastor from San Francisco to preach in your church in Tennessee, wouldn't you all say? So uh, I already know I'm maybe already confronting a hostile group, but hopefully I'll be able to win you over before the end of the day. Uh, I grew up here. I grew up here on the mountain. Um, and this church has always been a beacon for me. This is my first time ever being at this church. But coming off the mountain, we'd come off, and I would always crane my neck to look for the church. And it was kind of an indicator that we were at the valley. We were, we were at this, you know, the level spot. I remember one time I was coming back with some friends. We were hauling a load of stuff from Mississippi, and we came up the mountain here, and we uh, had a breakdown in the large truck uh, because the truck was going up at an incline for so long, the oil went to the back of the crankcase, I guess. We just had a breakdown. I'll never forget spending hours in the middle of the night just up the street from here. Uh, when I be, was growing up, uh, I became, you know, kind of a bad Venice. I don't know if we have any bad Venice here today, but welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, and I was, you know, I, I kind of did the transition from being an Adventist to a bad Venice, and I went to a sad Venice, and I became a glad Venice. But uh, I know that sometimes whenever I'd be running to Chattanooga to do my bad Venice things, um, the church was always kind of like a little reminder that, you know, God was watching and uh, I think it's important to remember that this church is really a symbol of what Sabbath is all about. It's a reminder every week that we have a God that loves us, a creator that's looking out for us. So I just want to thank you guys for keeping this church going. I know that this church has a purpose, a mission, and I'm so excited to see this family coming from Florida that's going to be your new teacher. Uh, they don't know that yet. You know, God's going to put that on their heart. Uh, but I'm the chairman of the board in San Francisco, and if you decide not to come here, come out to San Francisco. Uh, we got a spot for you out there, uh, but uh, it's just exciting to see what God does. Um, it was probably about 30, 35 years ago whenever I would drive by here on my wild ways, and we serve a God that uh, is able to get a hold of people's lives. Isn't that good news? Um, but today our scripture was, while we look not at the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. Today I'm going to invite you to take a look at what normally you don't see, and we're going to look at it a different way. Uh, let's see if I can figure out our clicker here. We're going to be looking at Revelation 12. Anybody read Revelation 12 before? What's Revelation 12 about? Okay, the church. The great controversy. All right, today we're going to look at it. But I want you to look at it maybe and you'll see something perhaps you haven't seen before. I feel a bit intimidated being up here because many of you know Revelation more than I do. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to bring some stuff to the table that perhaps is a reminder to you, but also perhaps will be new. So today with the sermon title is Revelation 12, the complete fill in the blank. At the end of our service today, we're going to fill in the blank. As we are moving in that direction, I want you to think about what is, what is the complete fill in the blank that we're looking for. Now when we look at Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, what we find is, I'm learning how to use my clicker again. What am I supposed to be pushing this? I went backwards? You never want a pastor going backwards because the church will go backwards, but let's go forward. Here we go. Uh, in order for us to understand Revelation, we have to have an understanding of what book in the Bible. Good, because Daniel helps us to understand Revelation. Revelation helps us to understand Daniel. They're actually part one, part two. We could say they're complementary books to each other. Uh, and I would just like to encourage anybody here that perhaps doesn't have this living, active relationship with Jesus Christ to study the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 pronounces a blessing on those who read, on those who listen, and on those who put it into practice. Many years ago, I had a younger brother. I won't say who it is because I don't want to point him out to you. But he was also following the ways of being a bad Venice. In fact, he was a heavy, heavy bad Venice. And so he came to live with me in California, and he saw some stuff in my life that perhaps he wanted to 
change his life, and so he asked me what he should do, and I said, you need to go through the book of Daniel and Revelation verse by verse by verse and just really get to know it. When Seth was done with the book of Revelation, he sold his car, he quit his job, a very well-paying job at Stanford University Hospital, and he went to the Philippines as a missionary. Revelation will change your life, friends. Maybe I should back up. God will change your life through the book of Revelation. So when we look at Revelation, we see here we have Daniel on the left, we have John on the right. Let's go back to the book of Daniel, okay? Daniel has four visions in it, okay? Who can tell me the first vision? Anybody want to guess? Oh, good, boy. <laughs> That's my nephew. He's the sharpest one on the block, right? So Daniel chapter 2, you have the metal man. The metal man is actually like a skeleton, okay? If you're going to take an anatomy and physiology class and you go, you're going to learn the bones. And then what do you go after the bones? Then you're going to go with the muscles. That's Daniel chapter 7. So we're going to build on Daniel chapter 7. Now generally we, we look at this as starting at the time of Daniel and ending at the second coming. So when you look at Daniel chapter 2, it's going to start at the time of Daniel and it's going to go till when? The second coming. Daniel chapter 7. You know the clean animals. You have the lion, the bear, the leopard, the... Yeah, the scary beast that doesn't even have a name. Again, it starts at the time of Daniel, and it goes all the way over to the second coming. Then we come to our next vision in Daniel. Our next vision in Daniel is the clean animals. That is the lamb, or the ram, and the goat. Starts at the time of Daniel, goes over to the second coming. And then what we have is we have Daniel 10 through 12, and I like to call that the details. That's like if you were to take a person, you get the... You have the skeleton, you have the muscles, you have, you know, the blood vessels, and then the last thing you have is you have the skin. The skin is the details. The difference between me and many of you, skin deep, right? Take my skin off, take your skin off, we're all going to look pretty much the same. So you look at Daniel 10 and 12, that's the details. So this is covering the same time frame, this is covering the same time frame, this. It's just you have some different details that the different visions are going to add to it. We find something very similar in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, you have Revelation 2 and 3, and this is the seven churches. Does anybody know what the time frame of the seven churches is? Where would it start? You would just want to guess? Is this a test? I'm just seeing if you guys have been following my brother's, what is it, Wednesday night Bible study? Um, but uh, this might be news to some of you, but we're going over really quickly. But essentially, it starts at Jesus. Seven churches start with Jesus, and they end with the second coming. And then you have another prophecy in Revelation. We call this the seven seals. And the seven seals start with Jesus, and it goes all the way to the second coming. Then you come to the seven trumpets. Now, the seven trumpets is kind of a touchy issue. Uh, there's different interpretations of the seven trumpets. One of the problems with the seven trumpets is Ellen White doesn't give us a lot of commentary on the second and trumpet. So some people take some different liberties with the seven trumpets, but there is uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I think, supporting evidence that it probably also starts with Jesus and goes all the way to the second coming. And then you have Revelation 12 to 20, and Revelation 12 to 20 is the details. And anybody want to guess what Revelation 12 to 20 starts with? It starts with Jesus, <laughs> and it goes all the way to the second coming. So today what we're going to do is we're going to just focus on Revelation chapter 12, but hopefully now you're getting kind of an idea of what Revelation 12 is. Revelation 12 is not just an island by itself. It's not a chapter by itself. No, Revelation 12 sets you up for all the verses that follow it up to Revelation chapter 20, and it's looking at the details. So if you could turn with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, and you're going to find that Revelation chapter 12 is a lot of, we could call these players, we could call these actors. Now, if you uh, watch a video or watch a movie or watch a documentary, normally what we say is, I watched the documentary last night. We don't say, I listened to it, unless you're a trucker and you keep your eyes on the road and you're listening to it. Generally, we say, we watched it. Hey, did you watch that movie? Did you watch this? I want you to think about Revelation as you have to watch it. You can't just read it. You have to watch it. And today I want us to watch Revelation chapter 12. So today what we're going to do is we're going to be introduced 
to the different players in Revelation chapter 12. Do any of you recognize any of these players up here? What do you recognize? The good lady. Okay, we see the good lady right here, okay? Anybody else? Who else do you see? Okay, got the dragon. Who else? Oh, we have the pregnant lady. Okay. What? The child, the baby. Isn't that a beautiful baby picture? All right, what else do you see? The remnant. This is where we get the remnant from in Revelation chapter 12. Who else do you see in Revelation 12? What other actor are we going to be talking about today? The woman that's running. A woman that's running, okay? So how do we put all of these together? Um, I want you to think about Revelation 12 as there's many ways of interpreting Revelation 12. Revelation, actually the whole book. And one of the things that's important to remember is it's a lot of visual scenes. I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw. Think, keep this in mind when we're reading Revelation 12 in just a few minutes, okay? It's almost like different shots. Now, I am not a person that watches movies. I don't encourage people to watch movies, but just imagine for a minute that you're back in my Bad Venice days and you're watching a movie. You know, they're going to be like, okay, focused on the parking lot, and then what happens to the camera? It switches over, and you're in the, the basement of some place telling what's going on over here. This is what Revelation is doing, okay? Revelation, I saw this, then I saw this, and then it all comes together. Now, there's a lot of people today that want to find evidence for God. Maybe out here you don't really need that because you're in the middle of the Bible Belt. San Francisco, it's the best mission field on the planet. <laughs> What's that? Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean... It's a wonderful place to work. But out there I hear a lot of people saying, do you have proof for God? Do you have evidence for God? One of the greatest evidence you can have for God is the Bible. Amen. And I'm not just saying the Bible, what it says, but the way the Bible is structured and written. Does anybody know how the re book of Revelation was written? Okay, John is on the Isle of Patmos. He's a prisoner. He doesn't sit down one day and say, scribe, come. And I just saw this. And the scribe writes it out and writes it out and writes it out. And they carefully seal it and they take it over to the publisher. No, probably the book of Revelation was written like this. Where John is in the spirit on the Lord's day. He works as a slave, as a prisoner. Hard labor for six days. But on the seventh day, he rests. And he picks up a little scrap of pottery and he starts jotting on it what he sees. And then that is smuggled out to the churches because he used to be the overseeing pastor of Asia Minor. And the person on the other end gets this. And I saw this. Okay, it comes from John. And I saw this. Oh, let's put that there. How would you put together the book of Revelation if it's coming in looking like this? Friends, when you hold the book of Revelation in your hand, you're holding evidence for God. Amen. Because when you look at Revelation, and today we're going to look at Revelation 12, and I want us to look at Revelation 12 different than we've looked at it before. Remember what Paul says. We don't look at what is seen, we look at what is unseen. And think about this as fragments that are being smuggled out of a prison island. And you and I are holding in our hands right now a miracle. The book of Revelation. Okay, so let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, please. Turn with me, please, to Revelation 12. Um, I believe that you'll get a little bit out of the sermon today if you listen. You'll get a whole lot more out if you read it yourself. So if you're one of those persons who usually likes to look at the back of the, um, the bulletin for the sermon, not today. <laughs> Get out your Bible. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. Verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. All right. First thing we have here is we have this woman. This woman is in a very precarious situation. Uh, I am fortunate to have gone to nursing school, so I have the best job in the world. I work with the body during the week, and I work with the soul on Sabbath. 
so as a pastor on Sabbath and throughout the week as well, but also I work part-time as a registered nurse. One of the things you will find is that a lady that is in labor is one of the most vulnerable people on the planet. Imagine for a moment, let me just interrupt for just a moment, I am so sorry. Hello? Yes. I don't. Put your wife up there and just have her click when you ask her to. Uh, you can look up in the PA group. Okay, then there's no bad. All right. Okay, I'm so sorry, folks. Our pastor back there is just getting the service started. <laughs> Looking for the clicker. <laughs> All right. Back to our lady in labor. Imagine this person is in labor. Someone comes up to rob her. Is it going to be an easy robbery? Is she going to jump up there and just wail on them? So I want you to think about this picture. Look at the picture you see right now in Revelation 1, verses 1 and 2. Revelation 12, 1 and 2. You have a pregnant woman that is in active labor. Okay? I've asked you today to do what to Revelation? Listen or to... Watch. What are we watching for next? We're going to change scenes. What's our next scene we see in Revelation 12, verse 3? A great red dragon. What do you think of when you see a pregnant woman and a great red dragon? Danger? There's also a contrast going on here. Do you think John did this purposely? He didn't start out with the dragon. He started out with the woman, and then he says, and I saw another Whoa! And we sit in here, we're watching, and we're like, wait a minute. This doesn't sound like a fair fight. I mean, this against, thank God I have a clicker. This? Okay, so let's, let's keep going here. Revelation 12, verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. I mean, this guy is decked out with power. In, in the Bible, when you see horns, it means power. When you, see, when you see heads, it means power. He has so much power, he doesn't know what to do with his power. Seven heads and ten horns? Where are you going to put the horns on the heads? Some, horns have two, some heads have two horns, some have one. I mean, it's just like dripping with power. Do you see the contrast between this and this right here? Okay, let's keep going. Here we go. And his tail threw, the, drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now, for those of you who haven't read Revelation 12 in a while, who is the red dragon? Satan. Okay, it's Satan. Who is those stars that his tail has just taken around? Those are a third of the angels. Now, we're not talking about, you know, drug addicts that he's able to confuse and seduce. We're talking about heavenly good angels and Revelation is telling us this big red dragon, it's not his paw that gets him or his mouth that gets him. It's his tail. I mean, he's just like, oh, I'm so big. And Tew! oh, a third of the angels just fell. Well, sorry about that, God. This is the picture you're seeing here. Now, let's back up here. Uh, we know what the red dragon is. Who can tell me what, who this represents? This is the church. This, more specifically, is the church of the Old Testament about ready to give birth to the Messiah, okay? So we have the pregnant lady, vulnerable, weak, probably not ready to put up a big fight. We see she's up against the dragon. Okay, let's get back to our uh, verse, verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to deliver her child as soon as it was born. Almost like a movie, right? You have the one side, the other side, now it comes together. We saw the woman, another great wonder appeared, and now suddenly the dragon is over there. If you look at the Greek word for stood, the Greek word for stood, we would think he's just kind of standing there. You can have a baby? When's the baby coming? No. In the Greek, it means crouched, ready to spring. Imagine a dragon sitting there, the heads looking this way and that way, focused on this woman, about ready to have a baby. He's about ready to spring. He's not there to catch the baby. He's not there to deliver the baby. He's there to devour the baby. Okay? 
Verse 5. And she brought forth a... Yes. Oh, there's our baby. What are you seeing here? Pregnant woman, weak. Big, strong baby. Big, strong red dragon, strong. Little bitty baby. Wait, do you see how John here is giving us these contrasts? And this might have been smuggled out over some period of time. And God put this all together for us. Wow. Are you starting to see kind of like a wow moment? Yes. So here's the baby. Verse 5. She brought forth a man child. Who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Who was the baby? Anybody know? Jesus. Jesus. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Now we have this woman running. Does she sound like a strong woman? Now please, don't see me as a sexist person. <laughs> I'm not. What is John trying to portray here? He's trying to use different symbols to show you a hidden message that's going on here. A hidden message. This woman goes running into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God where they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Revelation, you will find that it uh, introduces new concepts. When it introduces a new concept, it will explain that new concept in a few verses. There's a new concept that was introduced in Revelation 12. Does anybody know the new concept that we talked about so far in Revelation 12 that is not mentioned anywhere else in Revelation? The great red dragon. You don't have the great red dragon in Revelation 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You do have a reference to Satan in the seven churches. I know where you, I know where you live, where Satan has his seat. But there's not any real description of Satan up to Revelation 12. Remember, Revelation 12 is looking at time periods. We have the prophecies. Now, Revelation 12 through 20 is going to give us all the details. There's a major detail that has been hinted at in Revelation 1 through 11 that hasn't been described, and that is Satan. So now what John does is John says, hey, I've got to explain who this, who this great red dragon is. So now we take a little parenthesis. Here's our parenthesis time out in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. Now you might think it's introducing a new person here, Michael, but it's actually not introducing a new person here, Michael, because who is Michael? Christ. Now some people believe that Jesus is a, is a uh, created um, a created angel, and they'll say this is proof here that Michael, and then people say, no, 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 Jesus is fully God, therefore this cannot be Michael or Jesus. The truth of the matter is Jesus is fully God. Amen. Jesus is divine. Jesus, before he was a baby on this earth, his, his ways are from everlasting. Jesus is a third, one of the, one of the three persons of the Godhead, all right? And what we find is that Jesus, as Michael, is chief of the angels, but he's also chief messenger. Not created. Jesus was not created. Jesus is fully divine. Now, we find Jesus mentioned in Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. <laughs> and I heard a loud voice behind me saying, I turned and looked, and there was, there was, there was my friend. This is what John is saying. So when he talks about Michael here, this is the baby he doesn't really have to explain who it is. But there's somebody that's new here that we haven't seen before, and that is the great red dragon. So let's introduce, get introduced to the great red dragon. Verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And they prevailed not. Amen. Remember I heard a sermon one time, a black minister, you know, they can really preach, can't they? Amen. And he says, There was war in heaven, and he prevailed not. Hmm? You know, it's kind of like, yes! <laughs> Satan lost. Amen. Amen. There was war in heaven, and Satan prevailed not. Amen. There is war in your life, and Satan prevails not. Amen. There's war in your marriage, and Satan prevails not. Amen. There's war with your children because they don't come to church. And Satan prevails not. Amen. We serve a mighty God, don't we? Amen. 
Revelation 12, verse 8. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This is my only day with you. If we were good to spend more time, we would go to the end of this prophecy in Revelation, Revelation chapter 20. There you will find it reintroduces you to the great uh, serpent. It reintroduces you to that great red dragon. Again, you will find that he's being cast. In Revelation 20, where is Satan cast there? He is cast down to this earth. Chains are, so to speak, put over him, the chains of circumstances. That is the beginning of the millennium. And then at the end of the millennium, you will find that he is cast into the lake of fire. So we find these words, serpent, great red dragon, cast. That's a very strong connection to Revelation chapter 20. Then there's a celebration that happens in heaven, verse 11. And I heard a loud voice saying, in heaven now has come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. I mean, this is celebration in heaven. I mean, just think about it. When Satan loses, heaven, is vic heaven just breaks out in song. When you're victorious against Satan, heaven is jubilant about that. I mean, we need to realize this isn't just about me and my temptations and my... No, this is about heaven looking and it's like they're rooting. It's almost like a football team like, oh, yes! I mean, this is the yes moment right here. Yeah. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, verse 10, now has come salvation and strength. Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. By the blood of the lamb? You can overcome a dragon by the blood of a lamb? Are you seeing something here? We're watching Revelation 12. John is trying to help us to see. There's something going on behind the scenes. What you see, great red dragon. But there's something going on where a little, little baby, a pregnant woman, a woman running for her life, is stronger than the great red dragon? The blood? Blood, as we learned in our Sabbath school superintendent remarks today, is, is life. Yes. The lamb is giving his life, and that becomes victorious against Satan? Amen. Friends, we have to stop looking like everybody else looks around us. We have to see the un unseen. We have to see the invisible. We have to spend time in prayer. We have to spend time in God's word. Because with God's word, you and I can be victorious against Satan. Verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of Tennessee and California. Down. Because the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Because he knows that he has but a short time. Amen. We're stuck in that short time, aren't we? This last year has been hard for many people. I uh, work on a rescue helicopter at Stanford Hospital. And we pretty much have just been flying 24 hours a day. COVID patients, ECMO patients sick people. As a pastor, then I have to do the Zoom memorial services. Because we're stuck in that short amount of time where Satan knows he has a short amount of time. But friends, if you can last longer than he does, you win. So don't give up. He has a short amount of time. His contract is about ready to expire. <laughs> Ours is about ready to begin. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, time, and half a times from the face of the servant. In our, in our visual, we see this woman running into the wilderness. And as she runs into the wilderness, this is the only protection from this dragon. The dragon isn't seated on a throne or seated in a cage or anything. No, he's free to go whatever he wants, and he's chasing this woman into the wilderness. What is this a symbol of? 
This is a church. In the Bible, a woman is a symbol of a church. A pure woman is a symbol of God's true church. And a, and a very bad woman in Bible prophecy is a, is a symbol of an apostate church. So this is God's true church. And Satan just has her in his sight, and he is just chasing her all over the place. But she is given the wings of, what does it say, verse 14? She's been given two wings of a great eagle. You know, in our Sabbath school, we've been talking about the Old and the New Covenant. Exodus chapter 19, God comes to Moses, and he says to Moses, tell the people, you were slaves in Egypt, and you saw how I carried you with eagle's wings. Isaiah chapter 40 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. In the Bible, listen closely, in the Bible, eagle's wings is a symbol of divine help, divine intervention, divine empowerment. So when you and I turn our lives over to God in the morning, when we wake up and we dedicate to our, Him our lives, He promises to support us with those eagle's wings throughout the day. This woman, this church, this is you. Because we are the church, amen? amen? She is given the wings of a great eagle. That's the only way that she doesn't become dragon food. She's able to just keep one step ahead of him. And she goes into a place that's prepared for her. Oh, the serpent is furious. Verse 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. It's, it's like, have you ever been like on the... Like the, the children, you know, you're, in the, you're in the, uh, on the playground and you're trying to chase somebody and you just can't get up to them, so you take your ball and you just throw it at them to tag them, right? I mean, that's what you see here. The dragon just can't quite get the woman, so he just, you know, just kind of like, uh, like, a, like, a, like a frog, you know, just like that, that tongue, boom, ready to get her. But what happens? that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood, verse 15, verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. It's kind of interesting. We don't have time to look at this, but the dragon opens his mouth, and the earth opens its mouth, and the dragon puts out something out of his mouth, and the earth gets its mouth. I mean, you just kind of see this, like, exciting. Are you starting to see Revelation 12 now? You like this? All right, here we go. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war. Went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 12 sets the stage for this final vision, this final vision of details, Revelation 12 through 20. Revelation 12, if you'll notice, it takes us just... just decades and decades and centuries and centuries. I mean, you're just passing over quickly and then suddenly you're at the end of time and at the end of time now we're stopped because the dragon is there. He is angry. You know, we heard the children's story earlier and I liked one of the words that was used in the children's story. You know, Goliath had armor on so you couldn't even poke him with a spear. I think that's the nice children's story way of saying, <laughs> Right? <laughs> but you don't poke him with a spear. And then, like David, he was wearing his little shepherd's thing, and he could have poked him with a spear. And I just think of myself, you know that phrase, don't poke the bear, right? Well, this dragon has been poked and poked and poked, and now he is enraged. Look at the Greek word for enraged there in verse 17. My translation here says wrath. That is just, I mean, have you ever seen somebody that is just, they're, they're blind with rage? And this is the serpent now. He is, I mean, Satan is furious. Do you understand why we're seeing crazy things happening in the world today? Do you understand why in San Francisco we had 120 people die with COVID, which is the lowest of any metropolitan area because we are really into shutdown masks, everything else. Hey, folks, it does work. But we had 700 people die of fentanyl overdoses in San Francisco during the same amount of time. Do you understand why we're seeing crazy stuff happening around the world? Do you understand why you can put so much time and energy into a young person and then they go somewhere else? Because Satan is enraged. If you think that you can stay neutral in this fight, if you think that you can come to church and like, you know, put a few dollars in the offering, and please do that because we need help with the church budget, okay? But if you think that's all it's going to take to make it through this, you're sadly mistaken. 
You're not going to win unless you hang on to Jesus with everything you have. Because Satan is enraged with the remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now you might say, okay, fine. I'm just not going to be part of the remnant then. I'll just, I'll just get, out of, you know, get out of the limelight. Let Satan pound those poor other people that do that. No, 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 no. <laughs> because if you go to Satan's side, you still don't win. The only thing you win there is the hot place. And that's not comfortable because Satan's there too. I want to just point some things out as we close. And what time am I supposed to close today, Pastor? Okay, so because of COVID, we don't have potluck today. So you didn't see that in the bulletin, but we're going to be fasting. So our next meal is tomorrow morning when I get done. All right, I want to just look at something, though, that, 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 uh, that we, need to, we need to pay attention to. It talks about the dragon. It uses the word enormous. Dragon. Seven heads, ten horns, his tail, his tail, not his mouth, his tail, swept a third of the stars and flung them to the earth. He's crouched in front of the woman. He's ready to spring, devour the woman, filled with fury, pursued, spewed a torrent out of his mouth. He's enraged and he wants to make war. Do you see these words are all very large, grandiose words? These are words that are kind of frightening, right? Yes. Unless you're on their side, and then it's reassuring, right? But these are, these are big words, okay? I want you to look at these big words, okay? He stood on the shore of the sea, the dragon, okay? Now contrast that with the words that are used to describe our other key players. A pregnant woman cried out, about to deliver. She delivers the baby, and what happens to the baby? What does the word snatch mean? Doesn't it remind you of the Old Testament where, where Satan again is crouched in front of somebody, and, and then the man comes out and he says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, even the Lord rebuke you. Is not this a brand snatched from the fire? There you see the word right there, snatched up fled. The woman went into the wilderness and she was what? You know what that implies? She can't take care of herself. If she wasn't taken care of, she would have become extinct. Pursued and she requires supernatural help. Think about this, okay? So now we've gone from looking at all the symbols of Revelation to looking at looking at what's going on, kind of a, a hidden message of Revelation. Now you'll find these people that try to tell you about the hidden message of Genesis and the, the numerology of this. Friends, don't spend your time in crazy stuff. Spend your time in God's Word and you'll find some really crazy stuff. Do you see the message of Revelation 12? It's setting the stage for Revelation 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. It looks like the dragon wins. When you look around this earth today, what does it look like? It looks like Satan's, his way of doing things. And even if you're in a Christian state like Tennessee, there still is an awful lot of bad being masked as good. And it looks like he wins. And Revelation is painting a picture that really looks like it does in our churches and in our schools and in our homes where the good is strong I'm sorry the bad is strong and the good is kind of looked down on it's kind of weak people ask me what do you do for work well if I say I'm a flight nurse on a rescue helicopter they're like whoa or if I go the other way and I'm like well I'm a pastor they're like you're a what where do you get your money from why would you want to be a pastor the bad, I'm not saying flight nursing is bad, <laughs> the bad is looked up to sometimes. Young people, they want to go to Hollywood. They want to go make it big. They usually don't say, you know what? I'm going to go to Andrews. I'm going to go to Southern, make it big. I'm going to go do theology. It's like, what's your son doing? Oh, my, 
my oldest son, he's in dental school. My next son, he's, he's going to be a physician. And then my youngest son, he's, uh, he's taking theology. Oh, God bless him. <laughs> Isn't that the way it is sometimes? Revelation 12 paints it like it is. But it also tells you there's a hidden message. There's a hidden message. He tries to sweep her away. Okay, the woman is running. And I just want to tell you that this applies to us today. Revelation 12 isn't all about history. Revelation 12 is your life. Nothing is apparently more helpless. A pregnant woman. Nothing is apparently more helpless. A newborn baby. You know, a newborn baby just has a couple of reflexes. Anybody know what the reflexes are? Now we have nursing students here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the, 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 the suck reflex. <laughs> they need that to get food to grow. They also have the startle reflex. Just take the little kid and act like you're going to drop them. Ah, ah, ah. And then, of course, you're not going to have the parents let you hold their kid anymore after that, right? <laughs> Nothing is apparently more helpless. A pregnant lady, a newborn baby, a lady running through the wilderness. You. Nothing is apparently more helpless. Wherever you are right now, whether you're in school or at your job or in your marriage or whatever, nothing is apparently more helpless. Do you feel helpless? Anybody feel helpless? I'm working with a young lady right now that has an alcohol problem. Do you know what our biggest problem with her is? She thinks she can solve her own problems. What is the first step of AA? I'm powerless. I'm an alcoholic. Do you need help, friends? I mean, do you really need help? Do you understand you need help? Let me just tell you something. I'll just put it on here really thick. You can't save yourself. Your parents can't save you. Some of you here might be like me. I'm very fortunate to have godly mother and father. I'm even fortunate to have godly brothers and sister. Brother and sister. You know the one that was bad earlier? I mean, he's been my hero for many years. He can't save me. Your wife can't save you. Your church can't even save you. There's only one thing that can save us, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing is apparently more helpless. Prophets and Kings 174, let's finish the quote. Yet really more what? Invincible. What does invincible mean? Can't be conquered. What would you say? Omnipotent. Omnipotent means all powerful. Invincible. Okay? Revelation 12. Nothing is apparently more helpless. The helpless, the pregnant lady, the little baby, the running lady, the remnant, you know, just the last little piece of that's all that's left, versus the great red dragon that has seven heads and ten horns and his tail, when he twitches his tail, he can get a third of the angels to fall with him. But you and I are even more invincible than the red dragon. Wow. How? Than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on God. Amen. So, got to move through here very quickly. I'm running out of time. When you look at Revelation 12, you will find that there are some wins there, okay? Here's the first win you will find for the dragon. The dragon, it's a win. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Whew! He won. He won a third of the angels. And then he uh, stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Essentially, he's like, I can go anywhere I want. I can walk up and down on the earth. No one tells me what to do. There's a lady about ready to have a baby. All right. Let's just wait. Bring it on. That's a win. Now, does anybody see any loses or losses for the dragon in Revelation 12? Everything after that was a loss. 
Okay, let's go along with what uh, Jonathan says here, okay? Loss number one. Now, most of us would be looking at this and saying, well, yeah, he was kicked out of heaven, right? We remember that story where there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and he couldn't win. But take a look here. There's a hidden message in Revelation 12. Remember, we're following what Paul says. We don't look at what is seen, but we look at what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So check this out. This is so cool, okay? We have his win. Okay, so let's give it to Satan. He won one, okay? Here's his win right here. Loss number one. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Amen. How is that a loss for Satan? <laughs> Very good. The baby got away. I mean, a big monster that has a tail that can get a third of the angels and he lost the baby? He lost. That's a big loss. Let's look at again here. Loss number two. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. How is that a loss for Satan? He lost the woman. He lost the woman. The woman survives. Who is the woman a symbol of? The church. The church, the church survives. Amen. Amen. Loss number three. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. They're not even strong enough to stay in their apartment. They don't have a place in heaven anymore. Loss number three. Let's keep going here. Loss number four. And the great red dragon was? Cast out. Now, here's something for you people that like to do a little research. Research the word cast out. It doesn't mean to gently place something. In. I've cast it there. No, the word cast out means to fling with no regard where it lands. I mean, you get the picture and the great dragon was boom. Some people like to say, oh, it wasn't an actual war. It was actually a verbal argument. No, 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 no. He was cast out. He was flung. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. It's almost like John is just like writing this like, whoa, <laughs> cast out, cast out, cast out. Okay? Loss number four. Loss number five. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdoms of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now you might say, but that's what we were just talking about. There's actually a very subtle, uh, a very subtle delineation here. And let me just describe it to you very quickly. If you don't get it, please go to your pastor or Seth or your elders. They'll explain it in great detail, okay? When Satan was up in heaven, he rebelled against God, there was war in heaven, where was Satan cast out to? Wrong. He was cast out of heaven. Okay? The earth wasn't created at that point. Now, I know I, I tricked you on that one, but it's kind of like David Asher. He says, sometimes I just like to keep you awake. Okay? So, Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. They were allowed to go to where on the earth after creation? Only to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, he's cast out of heaven. Then, once he causes humans to fall, now he pretty much has full reign of the earth. And he can go anywhere he wants to. He can go to the heavenly councils that are held probably somewhere else not in heaven. We see that in Job chapter 1. But then at the cross, Satan crosses a line. And at that point, he is restricted to the earth. Up to that point, he could travel the universe, so to speak. He could, I can imagine in my mind's eye, stand at the gates of heaven and taunt the angels as they're coming and going. But after the cross, he's restricted to this earth. That's what this is talking about here. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation. This is spoken after the cross. So now there's another casting, you could say. Satan is, boom, out of heaven. And then Satan is, Boom! To the earth after the cross. Are you kind of following what I'm saying here? Then in Revelation 12, 20, like I told you, he is boom into his pit, so to speak. And then he is boom, sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. Okay, that's the word we don't say around our kids, right? But that's the lake of fire, right? Hell. You see these casting downs. Okay, so this is actually another loss for Satan. This is describing the loss after the cross. 
You all following me now? Okay, here we go. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So this is not talking about up in heaven anymore. This is talking about after the cross and the people after the cross. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Let's make it personal. You can overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. Satan can have... Dude. I made the PowerPoint. Play with me here, okay? And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I like it that you had your testimony time here early in the morning. I mean, uh, before church time. You can overcome Satan by your testimony. Okay, let's keep going here. Loss number five. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a what? Short time. Have you ever had short timer syndrome? You know, we see that a lot with nurses uh, in probably any profession where you've been a nurse for 25 years and you're going to retire in three months and, oh, you're just angry and you just, Aah! you know, it's just you have short timer syndrome. Satan has short timer syndrome. It's caused him to not want to be on vacation. He's just a little angry. He's kind of like what we heard in our children's story today, Saul. You know, he had short timer syndrome too. He didn't know he was going to be around a long time. Satan knows he has a short time. Loss number six. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought, brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. <laughs> he can't even catch the woman because she's flying away. Amen. Where she is nourished. What's, the word, what's that word for nourished? She's fed. But even more than fed, what does nourishment imply? She's given exactly what she needs to become strong. God's church during the dark ages, during the time of persecution, became strong. You, during your time of tribulation, during your time of trials, during your time with Jesus, are going to be nourished, and you're going to become strong. From the face of the serpent, another loss. I mean, if you look at this, Satan is the biggest... Oh, I've given away my sermon title. Um, Satan is... He just has losses all around. Yeah. I mean, he might have won when he got a third of the angels, but then it's just like loss, 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 and he's becoming more and more frustrated. Can you imagine if you're like the coach of a, of a football team or a soccer team or something, it's just like loss, 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 loss. If Christ's in your heart, you're like, okay, let's learn from this. If Christ is not in your heart, you're going to get angrier and angrier and angrier. This is Satan, okay? Loss number seven. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. <laughs> it's like, is there nobody on my side? And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. Yeah. He can't reach her because she has wings like a great eagle, which symbolize divine intervention. He throws after her this flood of water. The earth jumps up and helps her. Now, we're up to loss number seven. In scripture, what does seven mean? more complete. Uh, we would say it means completeness. Uh, we see this. The, there's, a, there's a principle uh, we call the, the rule of first use. So if you want to know what something means, look for the first place it's used, either in the Bible or in the New Testament, if you're in the New Testament. And what you'll find is that the first place seven is used in Scripture is in Genesis chapter 2. And thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And on the seventh day, God finished his work and he blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it the seventh day. I mean, seven means complete. Friends, Satan is a complete loser, okay? Satan is the complete loser. That's the message of Revelation chapter 12. Satan is the complete what? Loser. It's setting us up for Revelation 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. But never forget, as you're moving through those other chapters, Revelation 12 wants to let you know that in this great controversy, in this struggle, Satan is a complete loser. And this is a message that you need to hear today. This is the message I need to hear. This is the message our children need to hear. Even though it looks like bending the rules might get you ahead a little bit, Satan and his way is a complete loser. It's time for us to close. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. How did that war turn out? 
still going on right now in your life. It's still going on right now. You are a part of this war right here. It doesn't say how it turns out in Revelation 12. But Revelation 13, remember the principle of it introduces a concept, then it explains it? Revelation 13 explains this war from Satan's standpoint. Revelation 13. Revelation 13 is about a mark, about, sorry, about a beast, about an image to a beast, about the mark of the beast, about 666, about not being able to buy and sell, about a death decree. That's all Revelation 13. That's all describing this war right here. Revelation 14 is describing the war from the remnant standpoint. Revelation 13 is the, the tools that the, that, the, that the dragon uses. Revelation 14 is the tools that God's people use. So I'm just telling you this. I hope that I've developed a little curiosity in your heart to go back and read Revelation 12, 13, 14. Study it, friends. Your life will be changed. How many of you have been blessed by Seth? <laughs> You're like, who's Seth? How many of you have been blessed by my little brother Seth here? Anybody? It's because he read Revelation and his life was changed. Now, I'm not saying he's perfect. God's still working on him. But you know what? God wants to work on all of us. Amen. God wants to change us. And the way he does is when we get into his word. And Revelation chapter 20 actually is the companion of Revelation 12. And here's your homework for this week. I want you to look at all the players, list them out on a piece of paper in Revelation 12. Go and look for them in Revelation 20. You will find that it's completely flipped. The great red dragon suddenly is chained up. And the woman that's running, 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 running. The remnant, the tiny little bit that's left over. Look for them in Revelation 20. You'll find them. That little baby. Remember that little baby we talked about? Yep. Look for him in Revelation 20, uh, 20. Yeah, he's not little crying meek baby anymore. He's the king of kings, lord of lords, and he's the judge. So as we close today, I just want to encourage you. Start looking at things from heaven's perspective. Make a choice. I am going to completely cross the line and I'm not just going to be a casual Christian anymore. I'm not going to just be a person that just, you know, comes to church and stuff. I am going to jump in with both feet. If there's nothing else that we've learned from this past year than this, life is short, life is precious, and you're not guaranteed tomorrow. So friends, if this is your last week on earth, what would you do differently? If this is your last month on this earth, what are you going to do differently? Do it differently. Make a change. I'm never going to be here speaking to all of you in this setting ever again. There, if I'm invited back, I might, you know, there might be some of you here, some other people might be here. Remember, we have this moment to hold in our hands. Tomorrow we don't have. Turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Wake up every day and say, Dear God, please fill me with your Holy Spirit and then go out to answer that prayer. And friends, Whoopsie daisy. Seth, can you go back for me? I want to just close with a quote, but as we close today, if there's anybody here that says, you know what, I would like to make a change in my life, I'm not going to ask you to stand or anything, but I want you to talk to your pastor, to your elders. If you haven't been baptized yet, <laughs> show Satan where he stands. Amen. Walk into that water and say, my past is forgiven, my future is sure. I am part of the remnant. Amen. Thank you, Sophie. Let's read this all together as we close. Where did I go? Oh, no, we have to go through all this. Okay, hold on. This is a good review. <laughs> See? I feel like a professor. We're about ready to take out our pieces of paper. And now, here we go. Let's read this all together. Let's stand together. Let's read this all together. 
Nothing is apparently, okay, I can't hear you, so we got to speak up a little bit, okay? Here we go. We're saying this to the universe. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible than the soul that fills its nothingness and relies wholly on God. Do you believe that today? Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God in heaven, we just want to invite you into our hearts. We want to make a stand today and say that we choose to do things your way. We realize now clearly in Revelation 12 that Satan loses. And we want to be on the winning side. God, help us to not just be isolated winners, but help us to unite to help other people. Unite at our church. Unite with other believers to say that we want to help God in the great controversy. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you all to turn in your hymnals to 590. And she will lead out. And remember, this is what it means to Excuse be me. on the winning team. Sorry. Hymn number 590. We'll sing the first, third, and last stanzas. Hymn number 590. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, and a blessed if we trust and obey. Dear God in heaven, we just want to thank you for revelation that presents things like the world sees it. The big red dragon and the little teeny baby. But today we choose to be on the side of the baby. We choose to be on the side of the man child because revelation tells us he ultimately wins. I pray dear Father in heaven for those people that are weak in faith right now, those people that are perhaps struggling. Please give them an infilling of your Holy Spirit. Help them to just to turn their life completely over to Jesus Christ. And I just pray this week that they would experience miracles in their life. Not because they're good, but because they put their trust in Jesus Christ. I pray for your Holy Spirit to come into all of our lives. And may we be changed people because we've been with Jesus today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.